At Reading I had to change not only my carriage but my station. However, I was in time for the last train to Aford, and I reached the little dim-lit station after eleven o'clock. I was the only passenger who got out there, and there was no one upon the platform save a single sleepy porter with a lantern. As I passed out through the wicket gate, however, I found my acquaintance of the morning waiting in the shadow upon the other side. Without a word he grasped my arm and hurried me into a carriage, the door of which was standing open. He drew up the windows on either side, tapped on the woodwork, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse, interjected Holmes. Yes, only one. Did you observe the colour? Yes, I saw it by the side lights when I was stepping into the carriage. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh and glossy. Thank you. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Pray continue your most interesting statement. Away we went then, and we drove for at least an hour. Colonel Lysander Stark had said that it was only seven miles, but I should think from the rate that we seemed to go and from the time that we took that it must have been nearer twelve. He sat at my side in silence all the time, and I was aware more than once when I glanced in his direction that he was looking at me with great intensity. The country roads seemed to be not very good in that part of the world, for we lurched and jolted terribly. I tried to look out of the windows to see something of where we were, but they were made of frosted glass, and I could make out nothing save the occasional bright blur of a passing light. Now and then I hazarded some remark to break the monotony of the journey, but the colonel answered only in monosyllables, and the conversation soon flagged. At last, however, the bumping of the road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive, and the carriage came to a stand. Colonel Lysander Stark sprang out, and as I followed after him, pulled me swiftly into a porch which gaped in front of us. We stepped, as it were, right out of the carriage and into the hall, so that I failed to catch the most fleeting glance of the front of the house. The instant that I had crossed the threshold, the door slammed heavily behind us, and I heard faintly the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. It was pitch dark inside the house, and the colonel fumbled about looking for matches and muttering under his breath. Suddenly, a door opened at the other end of the passage, and a long, golden bar of light shot out in our direction. It grew broader, and a woman appeared with a lamp in her hand, which she held above her head, pushing her face forward and peering at us. I could see that she was pretty, and from the gloss with which the light shone upon her dark dress, I knew that it was a rich material. She spoke a few words in a foreign tongue, in a tone as though asking a question, and when my companion answered in a gruff monosyllable, she gave such a start that the lamp nearly fell from her hand. Colonel Stark went up to her, whispered something in her ear, and then, pushing her back into the room from whence she had come, he walked towards me again with the lamp in his hand. Perhaps you will have the kindness to wait in this room for a few minutes, said he, throwing open another door. It was a quiet, little, plainly furnished room, with a round table in the centre, on which several German books were scattered. Colonel Stark laid down the lamp on the top of a harmonium beside the door. I shall not keep you waiting an instant, said he, and vanished into the darkness. I glanced at the books upon the table, and in spite of my ignorance of German, I could see that two of them were treatises on science, the others being volumes of poetry. Then I walked across to the window, hoping that I might catch some glimpse of the countryside, but an oak shutter, heavily barred, was folded across it. It was a wonderfully silent house. There was an old clock ticking loudly somewhere in the passage, but otherwise everything was deadly still. A vague feeling of uneasiness began to steal over me. Who were these German people, and what were they doing living in this strange, out-of-the-way place? And where was the place? I was ten miles or so from Aford, that was all I knew, but whether north, south, east, or west, I had no idea. For that matter, Reading and possibly other large towns were within that radius, so the place might not be so secluded after all, yet it was quite certain from the absolute stillness that we were in the country. I paced up and down the room, 
humming a tune under my breath to keep up my spirits, and feeling that I was thoroughly earning my fifty-guinea fee. Suddenly, without any preliminary sound in the midst of the utter stillness, the door of my room swung slowly open. The woman was standing in the aperture, the darkness of the hall behind her, the yellow light from my lamp beating upon her eager and beautiful face. I could see at a glance that she was sick with fear, and the sight sent a chill to my own heart. She held up one shaking finger to warn me to be silent, and she shot a few whispered words of broken English at me, her eyes glancing back like those of a frightened horse into the gloom behind her. I would go, said she, trying hard as it seemed to me to speak calmly. I would go. I should not stay here. There is no good for you to do. But, madam, said I, I have not yet done what I came for. I cannot possibly leave until I have seen the machine. It is not worth your while to wait, she went on. You can pass through the door. No one hinders. And then, seeing that I smiled and shook my head, she suddenly threw aside her constraint and made a step forward with her hands wrung together. For the love of heaven, she whispered, get away from here before it is too late. But I am somewhat headstrong by nature and the more ready to engage in an affair when there is some obstacle in the way. I thought of my fifty-guinea fee, of my wearisome journey, and of the unpleasant night which seemed to be before me. Was it all to go for nothing? Why should I slink away without having carried out my commission, and without the payment which was my due? This woman might, for all I knew, be a monomaniac. With a stout bearing, therefore, though her manner had shaken me more than I cared to confess, I still shook my head and declared my intention of remaining where I was. She was about to renew her entreaties when a door slammed overhead and the sound of several footsteps was heard upon the stairs. She listened for an instant, threw up her hands with a despairing gesture, and vanished as suddenly and as noiselessly as she had come. The newcomers were Colonel Lysander Stark and a short, thick man with a chinchilla beard growing out of the creases of his double chin who was introduced to me as Mr. Ferguson. This is my secretary and manager, said the colonel. By the way, I was under the impression that I had left this door shut just now. I fear that you must have felt the draught. On the contrary, said I, I opened the door myself because I felt the room to be a little close. He shot one of his suspicious looks at me. Perhaps we had better proceed to business then, said he. Mr. Ferguson and I will take you up to see the machine. I had better put my hat on, I suppose. Oh, no, it is in the house. What? You dig fuller's earth in the house? No, no, this is only where we compress it, but never mind that. All we wish you to do is to examine the machine and to let us know what is wrong with it. We went upstairs together, the colonel first with a lamp, the fat manager and I behind him. It was a labyrinth of an old house, with corridors, passages, narrow winding staircases, and little low doors, the thresholds of which were hollowed out by the generations who had crossed them. There were no carpets and no signs of any furniture above the ground floor, while the plaster was peeling off the walls, and the damp was breaking through in green, unhealthy blotches. I tried to put on as unconcerned an air as possible, but I had not forgotten the warnings of the lady, even though I disregarded them, and I kept a keen eye upon my two companions. Ferguson appeared to be a morose and silent man, but I could see from the little that he had said that he was at least a fellow countryman. Colonel Lysander Stark stopped at last before a low door which he unlocked. Within was a small square room in which the three of us could hardly get at one time. Ferguson remained outside and the colonel ushered me in. We are now, said he, actually within the hydraulic press and it would be a particularly unpleasant thing for us if anyone were to turn it on. The ceiling of this small chamber is really the end of the descending piston, and it comes down with the force of many tons upon this metal floor. There are small lateral columns of water outside which receive the force, and which transmit and multiply it in the manner which is familiar to you. The machine goes readily enough, but there is some stiffness in the working of it, and it has lost a little of its force. Perhaps you will have the goodness to look it over and to show us how we can set it right. I took the lamp from him, and I examined the machine very thoroughly. It was indeed a gigantic one, and capable of exercising enormous pressure. When I passed outside, however, 
and I pressed down the levers which controlled it, I knew at once by the wishing sound that there was a slight leakage, which allowed a regurgitation of water through one of the side cylinders. An examination showed that one of the India rubber bands which was round the head of a driving rod had shrunk so as not quite to fill the socket along which it worked. This was clearly the cause of the loss of power, and I pointed it out to my companions, who followed my remarks very carefully, and asked several practical questions as to how they should proceed to set it right. When I had made it clear to them, I returned to the main chamber of the machine, and took a good look at it to satisfy my own curiosity. It was obvious at a glance that the story of the Fuller's Earth was the merest fabrication, for it would be absurd to have supposed that so powerful an engine could be designed for so inadequate a purpose. The walls were of wood, but the floor consisted of a large iron trough, and when I came to examine it, I could see a crust of metallic deposit all over it. I had stooped and was scraping at this to see exactly what it was, when I heard a muttered exclamation in German, and saw the cadaverous face of the colonel looking down at me. "'What are you doing there?' he asked. I felt angry at having been tricked by so elaborate a story as that which he had told me. "'I was admiring your fuller's earth,' said I. "'I think that I should be better able to advise you as to your machine if I knew what the exact purpose was for which it was used.' The instant that I uttered the words I regretted the rashness of my speech. His face set hard, and a baleful light sprang up in his grey eyes. Very well, said he, you shall know all about the machine. He took a step backward, slammed the little door, and turned the key in the lock. I rushed towards it, and pulled at the handle, but it was quite secure, and did not give in the least to my kicks and shoves. Hullo, I yelled. Hullo, Colonel, let me out! And then, suddenly, in the silence, I heard a sound which sent my heart into my mouth. It was the clank of the levers and the swish of the leaking cylinder. He had set the engine at work. The lamp still stood upon the floor where I had placed it when examining the trough. By its light I saw that the black ceiling was coming down upon me, slowly, jerkily. But, as none knew better than myself, with a force which must within a minute grind me to a shapeless pulp, I threw myself, screaming against the door, and dragged with my nails at the lock. I implored the colonel to let me out, but the remorseless clanking of the levers drowned my cries. The ceiling was only a foot or two above my head, and with my hand upraised I could feel its hard, rough surface. Then it flashed through my mind that the pain of my death would depend very much upon the position in which I met it. If I lay on my face the weight would come upon my spine, and I shuddered to think of that dreadful snap. Easier the other way, perhaps, and yet had I the nerve to lie and look up at that deadly black shadow wavering down upon me? Already I was unable to stand erect when my eye caught something which brought a gush of hope back to my heart. I have said that, though the floor and ceiling were of iron, the walls were of wood. As I gave a last hurried glance around, I saw a thin line of yellow light between two of the boards which broadened and broadened as a small panel was pushed backward. For an instant I could hardly believe that there was indeed a door which led away from death. The next instant I threw myself through and lay half fainting upon the other side. The panel had closed again behind me, but the crash of the lamp and a few moments afterwards the clang of the two slabs of metal told me how narrow had been my escape. I was recalled to myself by a frantic plucking at my wrist, and I found myself lying upon the stone floor of a narrow corridor, while a woman bent over me and tugged at me with her left hand, while she held a candle in her right. It was the same good friend whose warning I had so foolishly rejected. Come, come, she cried breathlessly. They will be here in a moment. They will see that you are not there. Oh, do not waste the so precious time, but come. This time, at least, I did not scorn her advice. I staggered to my feet and ran with her along the corridor and down a winding stair. The latter led to another broad passage, and just as we reached it we heard the sound of running feet and the shouting of two voices, one answering the other from the floor on which we were, and one from beneath. My guide stopped and looked about her like one who was at her wit's end. Then she threw open a door which led into a bedroom, through the window of which the moon was shining brightly. It is your only chance, said she. It is high, but it may be that you can jump it. 
As she spoke, a light sprang into view at the further end of the passage, and I saw the lean figure of Colonel Lysander Stark rushing forward with a lantern in one hand and a weapon like a butcher's cleaver in the other. I rushed across the bedroom, flung open the window, and looked out. How quiet and sweet and wholesome the garden looked in the moonlight, and it could not be more than thirty feet down. I clambered out upon the sill, but I hesitated to jump until I should have heard what passed between my saviour and the ruffian who pursued me. If she were ill-used, then at any risks I was determined to go back to her assistance. The thought had hardly flashed through my mind before he was at the door, pushing his way past her, but she threw her arms round him and tried to hold him back. Fritz! Fritz! she cried in English. Remember your promise after the last time. You said it should not be again. He will be silent? Oh, he will be silent! You are mad, Elise, he shouted, struggling to break away from her. You will be the ruin of us. He has seen too much. Let me pass, I say. He dashed her to one side, and rushing to the window, cut at me with his heavy weapon. I had let myself go and was hanging by the hands to the sill when his blow fell. I was conscious of a dull pain, my grip loosened, and I fell into the garden below. I was shaken but not hurt by the fall, so I picked myself up and rushed off among the bushes as hard as I could run, for I understood that I was far from being out of danger yet. Suddenly, however, as I ran, a deadly dizziness and sickness came over me. I glanced down at my hand, which was throbbing painfully, and then, for the first time, saw that my thumb had been cut off and that the blood was pouring from my wound. I endeavoured to tie my handkerchief round it, but there came a sudden buzzing in my ears, and next moment I fell in a dead faint among the rose bushes. How long I remained unconscious I cannot tell. It must have been a very long time, for the moon had sunk and a bright morning was breaking when I came to myself. My clothes were all sodden with dew, and my coat sleeve was drenched with blood from my wounded thumb. The smarting of it recalled in an instant all the particulars of my night's adventure, and I sprang to my feet with the feeling that I might hardly yet be safe from my pursuers. But to my astonishment, when I came to look round me, neither house nor garden were to be seen. I had been lying in an angle of the hedge close by the high road, and just a little lower down was a long building, which proved, upon my approaching it, to be the very station at which I had arrived upon the previous night. Were it not for the ugly wound upon my hand, all that had passed during those dreadful hours might have been an evil dream. Half dazed, I went into the station and asked about the morning train. There would be one to Reading in less than an hour. The same porter was on duty, I found, as had been there when I arrived. I inquired of him whether he had ever heard of Colonel Lysander Stark. The name was strange to him. Had he observed a carriage the night before waiting for me? No, he had not. Was there a police station anywhere near? There was one about three miles off. It was too far for me to go, weak and ill as I was. I determined to wait until I got back to town before telling my story to the police. It was a little past six when I arrived, so I went first to have my wound dressed, and then the doctor was kind enough to bring me along here. I put the case into your hands, and shall do exactly what you advise. We both sat in silence for some little time, after listening to this extraordinary narrative. Then Sherlock Holmes pulled down from the shelf one of the ponderous commonplace books in which he placed his cuttings. Here's an advertisement which will interest you, said he. It appeared in all the papers about a year ago. Listen to this. Lost on the ninth instant. Mr. Jeremiah Hailing, aged twenty-six, a hydraulic engineer, left his lodgings at ten o'clock at night and has not been heard of since. Was dressed in... etc., etc. Ah, that represents the last time that the colonel needed to have his machine overhauled, I fancy. Good heavens! cried my patient. Then that explains what the girl said. Undoubtedly. It is quite clear that the colonel was a cool and desperate man who was absolutely determined that nothing should stand in the way of his little game, like those out-and-out -out pirates who will leave no survivor from a captured ship. Well, every moment now is precious, so if you feel equal to it, we shall go down to Scotland Yard at once as a preliminary to starting for Aford. Some three hours or so afterwards, we were all in the train together, bound from Reading to the little Berkshire village. 
There were Sherlock Holmes, the hydraulic engineer, Inspector Bradstreet of Scotland Yard, a plain clothes man, and myself. Bradstreet had spread an ordnance map of the county out upon the seat and was busy with his compasses, drawing a circle with aphid for its centre. There you are, said he. That circle is drawn at a radius of ten miles from the village. The place we want must be somewhere near that line. You said ten miles, I think, sir. It was an hour's good drive. And you think that they brought you back all that way when you were unconscious? They must have done so. I have a confused memory, too, of having been lifted and conveyed somewhere. What I cannot understand, said I, is why they should have spared you when they found you lying fainting in the garden. Perhaps the villain was softened by the woman's entreaties? I hardly think that likely. I never saw a more inexorable face in my life. Oh, we shall soon clear up all that, said Bradstreet. Well, I have drawn my circle, and I only wish I knew at what point upon it the folk that we are in search of are to be found. I think I could lay my finger on it, said Holmes quietly. Really now, cried the inspector, you have formed your opinion. Come now, we shall see who agrees with you. I say it is south, for the country is more deserted there. And I say east, said my patient. I am for west, remarked the plain-clothes man. There are several quiet little villages up there. And I am for north, said I, because there are no hills there, and our friend says that he did not notice the carriage go up any. Come, cried the inspector, laughing. It's a very pretty diversity of opinion. We have boxed the compass among us. Who do you give your casting vote to? You are all wrong. But we can't all be. Oh, yes, you can. This is my point. He placed his finger in the centre of the circle. This is where we shall find them. But the twelve-mile drive, gasped Hatherley. Six out and six back. Nothing simpler. You say yourself that the horse was fresh and glossy when you got in. How could it be that if it had gone twelve miles over heavy roads? Indeed, it is a likely ruse enough, observed Bradstreet thoughtfully. Of course, there can be no doubt as to the nature of this gang. None at all, said Holmes. They are coiners on a large scale and have used the machine to form the amalgam which has taken the place of silver. We have known for some time that the clever gang was at work, said the inspector. They have been turning out half-crowns by the thousand. We even traced them as far as Reading, but could get no farther, for they had covered their traces in a way that showed that they were very old hands. But now, thanks to this lucky chance, I think that we have got them right enough. But the inspector was mistaken for those criminals were not destined to fall into the hands of justice. As we rolled into Aford Station, we saw a gigantic column of smoke which streamed up from behind a small clump of trees in the neighbourhood and hung like an immense ostrich feather over the landscape. A house on fire? asked Bradstreet as the train steamed off again on its way. Yes, sir, said the station master. When did it break out? I hear that it was during the night, sir, but it has got worse, and the whole place is in a blaze. Whose house is it? Dr. Becker's. Tell me, broke in the engineer, is Dr. Becker a German, very thin with a long, sharp nose? The station master laughed heartily. No, oh, sir, Dr. Becker's an Englishman, and there isn't a man in the parish who has a better lined waistcoat. But he has a gentleman staying with him, a patient, as I understand, who is a foreigner, and he looks as if a little Berkshire beef would do him no harm. The station master had not finished his speech before we were all hastening in the direction of the fire. The road topped a low hill, and there was a great widespread whitewashed building in front of us, spouting fire at every chink and window, while in the garden in front three fire engines were vainly striving to keep the flames under. That's it, cried Hatherley in intense excitement. There's the gravel drive, and there are the rose bushes where I lay. That second window is the one that I jumped from. Well, at least, said Holmes, you have had your revenge upon them. There can be no question that it was your oil lamp which, when it was crushed in the press, set fire to the wooden walls, though no doubt they were too excited in the chase after you to observe it at the time. Now keep your eyes open in this crowd for your friends of last night, though I very much fear that they are a good hundred miles off by now. And Holmes's fears came to be realized, for from that day to this, no word has ever been heard either of the beautiful woman, the sinister German, or the morose Englishman. 
Early that morning, a peasant had met a cart containing several people and some very bulky boxes driving rapidly in the direction of Reading, but there all traces of the fugitives disappeared, and even Holmes's ingenuity failed ever to discover the least clue as to their whereabouts. The firemen had been much perturbed at the strange arrangements which they had found within, and still more so by discovering a newly severed human thumb upon a window sill of the second floor. About sunset, however, their efforts were at last successful, and they subdued the flames, but not before the roof had fallen in, and the whole place had been reduced to such absolute ruin that, save some twisted cylinders and iron piping, not a trace remained of the machinery which had cost our unfortunate acquaintance so dearly. Large masses of nickel and of tin were discovered stored in an outhouse, but no coins were to be found, which may have explained the presence of those bulky boxes which have been already referred to. How our hydraulic engineer had been conveyed from the garden to the spot where he recovered his senses might have remained forever a mystery were it not for the soft mould which told us a very plain tale. He had evidently been carried down by two persons, one of whom had remarkably small feet and the other unusually large ones. On the whole, it was most probable that the silent Englishman, being less bold or less murderous than his companion, had assisted the woman to bear the unconscious man out of the way of danger. Well, said our engineer ruefully, as we took our seats to return once more to London, it has been a pretty business for me. I have lost my thumb, and I have lost a fifty-guinea fee. And what have I gained? Experience, said Holmes, laughing. Indirectly it may be of value, you know. You have only to put it into words to gain the reputation of being excellent company for the remainder of your existence.'